They have done abominable works. There is none who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there are any who understand, who seek God. They have all turned aside. They have together become corrupt. There is none who does good, no, not one. Have all the workers of iniquity no knowledge, who eat up my people as they eat bread? And do not, they not call on the Lord? They are, there they are in a great fear, for God is with the generation of the righteous. For God is with the generation of the righteous. You are here. That's speaking to us. God is with you. God is with you. You shame the counsel of the poor, but the Lord is his refuge. Oh, that the salvation of Israel would come out of Zion. When the Lord brings back the, uh, the captivity of his people, let Jacob rejoice and Israel be glad. Hey, there is a day coming in the future where there will be a great revival even in Israel. Uh, but right now we see the adversity coming upon them and all the nations around them. And we need to have compassion for the loss of life, uh, not only there, but also even in our nation, even as we speak. And so many people are so uh, inundated and become quite carnal, even to the loss of life. We've adapted to it. But we need to be sympathetic to one another and have empathy for the nations around there, but also even here, the ones we see each and every day. Uh, even uh, as we know, even the loss of life of the babies and abortion and all that's going on, that's killing us. It's all under inconvenience, not all, much of under inconvenience. Uh, and not the value of life. Today, I want to let you know, you are valuable. Amen. You are valuable. Every precious soul is valuable in God's eyes. And I also want to let you know God loves you just as you are. He loves you just as you are. And you are unique. And I want to welcome you to Lighthouse in your uniqueness, meaning that you have something to give to God, each and every individual. Every one of you are special. And every one of you are gifted. And in a beautiful church, a healthy church, is one where people feel free to apply their giftings and let the Spirit of God move through them. And I encourage you today just to let you know that you are precious in the sight of the Lord. You are so precious. I want to cover a few announcements. Uh, today is the harvest heyday, so come bring in your food. No, no it is not. Uh, we saw the weather earlier in the week, and we decided we would postpone. We take this a little wisdom. I have some wisdom every once in a while. And I thought 39 degrees and having a hay rack ride and maybe rain, it just didn't sound like a good time to me. And you can only get so many blankets. And so we want to have a good time together. So we won't be having the harvest heyday today. Okay? Everyone got that, right? We won't. What we plan to do, you never know what the weather's going to do this time of year, any time of year, quite honestly. But November the 12th. Mark your calendar, Sunday, November the 12th. That's in two weeks. Everyone says two weeks. Two weeks. All right, cool. Because November the 12th, we will be having our church Thanksgiving dinner. Because we are thankful. And we want to come together and have a great time together. And if the Lord wills, then we will also have our Harvest Pay Day activities at that time. Weather permitting. You know, we like to have the hay rack ride. Those of you that have done the hay rack ride, it goes around the section or so. It, it's, it's just a, a lot of fun. It's just a good time. And who knows? It could be 70 degrees on November the 12th. Right? So we'll, we'll plan on that. Be in prayer about that activity. But ultimately, I want to encourage you to invite people to do that. Why do we do that? We do activities for we can have fellowship with each other. But also to give you opportunity to invite some people. Say, hey, come on in and enjoy the time together. And get to meet the saints of God and be welcome. So that will be November the 12th. Please keep that in mind. And those that are making pies for that activity, we're going to do that on November the 12th. If you make a mistake and bring a pie tonight for youth, possibly, you know, we can still eat it. It's okay. We'll judge it, even. You know, I, I think we would. You're all winners. You're all winners. Yeah, in my eyes. So if you want to bring a pie tonight, you still can. But I would wait even the two weeks to have it a harvest hay day. Um, business meeting. We had that scheduled actually the 12th. I double booked. The reality is we want to bump that up up to next Sunday. 
So guys and, and girls, whoever's involved in the men's business meeting, uh, make sure and plan on meeting after the service next Sunday. Uh, also says in your bulletin, there will be no senior saints meals or ladies fellowship in November. So we can put our focus on Thanksgiving meal. There's a lot going on in November. And so those two events, both senior saints, correct? Sandy, correct. And ladies fellowship will not be coming together in November at this point. So please keep that in mind as well. Uh, our prayer box is back in the back. Make sure and put a, fill out a card uh, for your prayer needs. And if you have immediate needs, please feel free to touch base with one of us. We'd love to pray with you. This church, we ought to be a house of prayer. So that means you can grab someone and say, pray for me. It could be a pastor or it could be someone you have faith in to pray one for another. So make sure and do that and we will be known for our prayer. Um, Wednesday nights, uh, we will be meeting this Wednesday. Last week, uh, Gary actually actually taught and did a great job, I thought. This week, I, I will be teaching. Um, this Wednesday night at 6.30. Now, we have great dialogue. You get a chance. I know that you, when I preach, you have all, I give you all the answers. You get it all figured out. You walk away, and you don't have a single question in your mind, right? <laughs> Sometimes you walk away and say, what does that mean? What does that mean? And then during a service, we don't get a chance to really talk about it, right? Well, Wednesday nights, we get to dialogue and talk about it and get to talk about tough issues and tough things. We're going through the book of John. We'll be uh, looking at John 14 this week. So please feel free to come and just kind of have a good time together in class. So that's this Wednesday night. Uh, let's stand on the building and go to the Lord in prayer. And we won't be having yes. Hey, Scott, I had one more. Note. Okay. <clears throat> Hello everyone. Um, it is Pastor Appreciation Month, so we sometimes like to wait till the last day to surprise. But we wanted to just say, up here. <laughs> and where's Lisa? She's sick. Oh, okay. Well, um, we just got you guys a little thank you card, and we wanted to tell you how much we appreciate you, all the stuff you do behind the scenes. It's not an easy job. Um, we're very thankful to have you guys. Thank you, um, so we just want to say thank you. Thank you. And I snuck that on there after you checked it. <laughs> oh, yeah, there it is. <laughs> There's no place I'd rather be than Lighthouse this morning. How about y'all? Amen. Amen. No place I'd rather be, for right. sure. It is a privilege, uh, yes. Uh, anyway, I can go on and talk about that. In pastoring, uh, you better be called. And uh, it's uh, many things you deal with, but I tell you what, you're a blessing to us. Amen. You're a blessing. We love you dearly. And we love this church and what God's doing even today. This is what it's all about. An opportunity to worship Him and bring new life. Encourage, looking forward to many new things today. Hey, Scott, uh, yes. before you start the prayer too. If you guys will pray for Brad and Megan, mm -hmm. the twins have been in the NIC unit for two weeks tomorrow, and they took them off of everything yesterday and the feeding tubes, but now through the night, it's stressing their bodies and they, their oxygen has started to drop just a little bit, so it's probably going to be longer before they get out, but they're just, I tell them that's just a little hiccup here and there, but... Brad then just been tired and discouraged from yeah. being in the hospital. Oh, yeah. Oh, most definitely. Most definitely. Which, uh, if you didn't know, they were blessed with uh, two twin grandbabies uh, a few weeks ago. Two weeks ago. Uh, so definitely want to be praying for them, also for those who are sick, one included is my wife, but also uh, for all those you may be aware of. We need to definitely be praying for them and for our nations as a whole. Uh, let's stand in the building, and we won't be having meet and greet today, so we'll go, Lord, in prayer, and, and we'll be worshiping our Lord and Savior. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we honor you and praise you, God. You are amazing and mighty. Father, right now, we are we come together in unity of spirit. I pray, God, we uh, honor you and give you all the glory and praise due your name. Father, you are the King of kings, the Lord of lords. 
You are the one who has the hope in a hopeless world. Uh, Father, right now we raise up those that are, are struggling, we're going through with just such travesty and such terrible things, even with wars and, and going on in Israel, the Middle East, uh, Palestine. Father, and the loss of life. Father, I pray, Lord, that you come quickly. I pray for peace in Jerusalem. I pray, God, that you come quickly and bring your people to your to the saving knowledge of your, of, of your hope and peace through Jesus Christ. And Father, even today, I pray for those that are sick, uh, that you would heal them and strengthen them, Father, and that you would bring uh, peace into their heart. Those that may be struggling in their bodies, I pray for healing by, by your stripes, Lord Jesus. I pray that come upon them, and we trust you by faith in your name. And Lord, I pray for Lisa, that you would heal her, Father, give her strength. I pray for all those that are struggling in their bodies, that you heal them. Lord, I, there are those that are struggling in their minds, uh, Father, with their emotions and, 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 and struggling with life. And I pray, God, you bring substance to their life. Let them know how valuable they are and how precious they are. And, Lord, even today, this is a precious moment we have as an opportunity as a church to worship you. And, Lord, what an amazing time we're going to have today in celebrating new life, Father, even in baptisms. And, Father, how great it is to know that you are the resurrection and the life. And we honor and praise you. And we do love you in Jesus' name. The church said, Amen. Amen. Let's worship God today. viruses and stuff going around we don't want to share everything so if you want to take just a second to turn to your neighbors say good morning give them a smile good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'd rather have the car, I'd rather 
have the house. I'd rather have this. Is there anything in this world that you say, I'd rather have than Jesus Christ? I can't think of a thing. I can't think of anything. How precious it is to have Jesus. Come on, saints of God. Is that not true? How precious it is to have Jesus. No man can take that from you. No bank can mark a knock on your door can take it away. No man can take that from you. I'd rather have Jesus than anything. Than anything.
you all to sing that shout to the Lord. Uh, let's sing it one more time. Here's why. The scripture says if you, we don't cry out, the rocks are going to cry out. The scripture says if, if other things of this world uh, don't cry out, we need to cry out. We need to shout to the Lord saying, you are my king. Yeah. Hey, the world's crying out saying things in opposition to our God. Right. We need to be strong and courageous and say, we believe in God. Yeah. We know who he is. He's my God, my Savior. We need to shout to the Lord. We don't need to shout to the Lord. It's okay. It's okay. Sing. But hey, how about shout to the Lord and praise His holy name? Hey, we serve the King of kings, the Lord of lords. He's in charge of this chaotic world. And He's going to take it back someday. Amen. Hey, there are principalities and powers of the air. I feel like preaching already. But we need to shout to the Lord. Let's get some excitement about who he is and praise his holy name.
you inhabit the praise of your people this morning, mighty God. That you'd give us an ear to hear, mighty God. We bless you. We worship you this morning, mighty God. For you are worthy. You're worthy. Father, have your way in this house this morning. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated as Children's Church and preschool are dismissed at this time. <coughs> you know, today is a glorious day, and I don't find it coincidental because I don't. I think God doesn't work in coincidence; He works in providence. Uh, that's this series I started a few weeks back, uh, before the war even break down, as far as the current war, uh, about joy, contagious joy, and I believe that God wants to encourage us in the times of adversity, and I believe that we're going to we live in a day and age that we're going to see a revival around us in those that are truly looking for hope. And that can truly find joy in a world that seems to be falling apart. Because after all, saints of God, we have the answer right before us. Amen. We have the answer. We've been worshiping Him and praising Him, some of you your whole life, some of you for years, some of you for days. But I'm here to tell you we have a message of hope. And I serve a God that's greater than anything we may face. Do you believe that, saints of God? Yes. Yes. Do you believe we serve a God that's greater than anything you're facing? Yes. Do you believe God's real? Come on, saints of God. Yes. Do you believe He is God, the God of 
kings of kings, the Lord of lords. We believe he's over everything we just sang about. Yes. Do we believe it? Yes. Do you believe he's even greater than any war that will happen that mankind may develop? Amen. Or any weapon. I've been looking, how many of you kind of geeky as far as looking at some apps and saying about, oh, the new weapon and different things. First, you don't believe everything you read. That's right. Because after all, there's lasers flying everywhere. It seems like in some of those, I was looking at some of the many things that man's weaponry and this weapon here may conquer the world or this weapon here will destroy the world. Hey, I got news for you. God's still in charge of this world. Yes. And he will see us through. Amen. He will see us through one way or another. This is the time of hope. This is the time actually of excitement. Right. What do you mean, pastor? It seems like things are falling apart. Well, not in God's kingdom. That's right. This is a time of excitement to know that what's written in his word is being written and has been unfolding before our very eyes. True. So we ought to be encouraged, not discouraged. Now that being said, be wise. Be wise for the things around us. Families, men, you need to be reading, leading and reading, leading your families to God now more than ever. Families need to be running to God. What are we going to wait for? Is it worse? Because it probably will. Do we wait till things are just falling apart? Then we cry out. Well, the reality, now is the time of day. Today is the day of your salvation. Today is the day to make things right. Do you realize you're held accountable for everything you hear of the gospel? Even today, maybe you're visiting today. Welcome all visitors to be here today. Maybe you're here because the family member is getting baptized. Praise God for that. But maybe you're here. It's not coincidental you're here. It's providential. Because God loves you. He wants you to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, today if you turn to Philippians chapter 3, Philippians 3, verses 1 through 11, talking about being sold out for Christ. Now remember, Paul was writing this, and he was a very studious person, a Pharisee of Pharisees, if you will. Uh, and in his, as far as his uh, learning, his education, and he was rising to the top of his religion. He was rising to the top of his religion. Think about that. Yet he found out that that wasn't where true point peace and joy was at. Right? So Philippians 3, it says this. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same things to you is not tedious. But for you, it is safe. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the mutilation. For we are the circumcision. Uh, who worship God in spirit. Rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I also might have confidence in the flesh... If anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. Circumcised the eighth, eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. In his religion... He would view himself as being earning anything, any type of righteousness that he may achieve, even blameless. So I wonder, even pausing here, if you were to think you could go to heaven by your religion, does anyone in here think you could uh, compare your walk with Paul? I mean, does anyone in here think that, I mean, you're such a good person. You never cuss. You don't drink, you don't smoke, you don't do this, you don't do that, you don't do all these don'ts you don't do. You, you come to church faithfully, you, uh, you tithe, you do all these things, and you look at yourself and say, man, I'm good. I, I'm, I'm righteous. I, I've earned something. God, look at me. Boy, that's sad, isn't it? We're going to talk more about that in a few moments. But compared to Paul, I mean, if he was standing here today and we were to, we were to compare our resumes, if you will, in religion, he would beat any one of us. He's more religious than anyone in this room. 
even considered blameless. Yeah, we're going to see what he considered that as we read this, what he thought of that, and what we should think of our own righteousness. Let's go on and see what he had to say. Verse 7, But what things were gained to me, these I counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed, I also counted all things lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ, my Lord, for whom I've suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish. Or King James would say, done. <laughs> that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. Now we see here two different types of righteousness. My righteousness or his righteousness. Keep that in mind. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Here's a, here's a revelation that you may not have known. You, are you ready? You, you can't get ready? We're all going to die. Wow. Pastor, that's kind of a downer. Really? We're all going to die? It's like, <laughs> I know, right? It's like, but not everyone's going to live. See, the reality is that because of his resurrection, through Jesus Christ, that we live eternally. We live eternally. See, everyone in here is eternal beings. Everyone in here is an eternal being. The question is, where will you spend your eternity? Later, when we do the baptism, you're going to see symbolism of death, burial, and resurrection. Resurrected to new life. Aren't you glad for Jesus? Amen. Come on. Aren't you happy for Jesus? Amen. For the salvation he gives us? Beware. To start off this. That gets your attention, doesn't it? Wow. Beware. What's he say beware of? The world. The things in this world. Well, a little later he talks about that. But he says beware of religious people. Religious. Self-righteous religious people. Beware of them. Beware of people that cause problems, divisions, and think of themselves more highly than they ought to. Beware of them. And he even calls even three different segments of people. One, he says, for they are dogs. Wow, that's strong stuff, isn't it? Beware of those religious people, or he calls them even dogs. Judaizers snapped at Paul's heels and followed him from place to place, barking their false doctrines. They were troublemakers and carriers of dangerous infections. See, as he would tour and go around the world, in the, his area, he, would, he went on his evangelistic uh, mission field, that there were others that would follow behind him. And can you imagine how frustrating that would be to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, and we're, we're through his death, burial, and resurrection, and his righteousness... That you can be made whole, whole, and that you no longer have to trust your righteousness, trust Him and His righteousness, and you can be saved. That's a good gospel, isn't it? Amen. You mean, Pastor, I don't have to work harder to attain my salvation? That's right. He would preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, but inevitably there were people following him around saying, That's wrong. You have to. And he called them dogs. Because they were basing themselves, their gospel, on another gospel, which is no hope. It's a works-based system. And if you are in a church, or ever been in a church that's a works-based system, that's a miserable place to be. What do you mean, Pastor? Well, because you're never good enough. You can't work hard enough. You can't do this or that enough to ever feel confident of that blessed assurance Jesus is mine. And there are many religions that you can go to that are very religious. Paul was very religious. They consider it dumb. All that religion. 
as opposed to relationship. We'll talk about that more. He said those evil doers, those dogs that come around and pervert the gospel. Secondly, evil workers. These taught that the sinner was saved by faith plus good works, especially the works of the law. These good works are performed by flesh, old nature, and now the spirit, not the spirit, and they glorify the worker, not Jesus Christ. See, if you're ever in a works-based religion, it's all about, look at me. It's all about, look at my works. I'm space, I tell you, I appreciate doing all this. this is amazing, and many space is amazing, and I don't want to start calling out all the great works because I'm going to rob of his glory. But what if I say, i got to be better than space? Whoops. i, I got to be better than space, so I'm going to work harder. Every time he mows the lawn, I'm going to go out, I'm going to mow it twice more. Every time he sets this up and takes it down, then I'm going to have to do something twice as good. i got to figure this out because he's beating me. Isn't that sad to think of it that way? Because the thing is, what I know, space isn't doing it for your acclamation or for me to say these things. He's doing it as of the Lord. It's a privilege. He's, he's fulfilling his gifting. And so are you, if you're living for God. But aren't you glad it's not like you have to be better than someone else? Someone said amen. You don't even have to be better than the pastor. Oh, praise God, you don't read that one. Right? See, that, but that's what they were doing. They were saying, look at our righteousness, and you've got to get better than this, or you can never be saved. See, the reality is this. In Titus 3, 4 through 7, it says, because of his grace, he declared us righteous and gave us confidence that we will inherit eternal life. Because of his grace, he declared you righteous. Righteous. Now, it's one thing the pastor, if you come before me or a priest and say, declare me righteous, priest. Declare me righteous, pastor. I don't declare anyone. It's him that declares you righteous. I just aim you to Jesus Christ. I aim you to Jesus Christ. But this is all about aiming you to Jesus Christ. If you don't know him, today's the day of your salvation. You're going to be liberated from self-righteousness today. He goes on to call them uh, the mutilation. The mutilation. The Judaizers said this in Acts 15, 1. And you can turn to Acts 15. We're going to read a little bit there. If you want to turn to Acts 15. They said, some came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you're circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Unless you're circumcised, you can't be <coughs> saved. And then they created a large argument in the church. And you'll read about that in Acts 15, actually, so much so that they had to go to Jerusalem with the apostles and, and get some uh, answers about this. It says in Acts 15 this, and certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you can't be saved. Therefore, when Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and dispute with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others should go to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. There was a great dispute. Now, I know in churches that we never have these disputes here. I mean, we never, we always agree on everything. Now, sometimes we have our disputes. Even, i got news for you, even Pastor Kenny and I don't agree 100% on every point. Oh, we're, we're, we're together. We think a lot alike, but there's a few things that we think, oh, what do you think about, what do you think about that? We were just discussing this on the phone the other day. So things that are not specified in Scripture that we're just chewing on. And I think this, I think that. Now, that's not a dispute. That's becoming sharper and working on it. We weren't disputing. Don't get the wrong impression there. But when we start disputing, we're in error. When we start arguing, we're in error. That's right. Amen. And it happens in churches commonly. And it was happening in Acts 15. What they were saying was this. Hey, the gospel of Jesus Christ is great. 
The Jews were saying, but hey, these Gentiles have got to be circumcised or they can't be saved. And there was a great dispute. And they went to Jerusalem, even to the apostles, and discussed this. In verse 6, it says, Now the apostles and elders came together and considered this matter. And when they had been, there had been a much disputing about it. Verse 8, Peter says, So God, who knows the heart, uh, acknowledged them by giving the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us, and made no distinction, distinction between us and them. He was saying, you know these Gentiles that you were saying they've got to do this? Well, he said, God made no distinction between Jew and Gentile. As a matter of fact, I can just see him saying this. Let me relay a story to you. Just a few days ago, it's in Acts 10, you'll read about it. God sent Peter to the Gentiles, Cornelius and his whole household. Now, let me tell you what happened. It's pretty amazing. Peter didn't want to go, him being a Jew. He thought, I can't go there. Those people are a bunch of heathens. Unclean. Unclean. And by the way, how many Jews are in the house? So bring me. I don't know, maybe Jewish descent, but totally. <coughs> so you guys are a bunch of heathens. Can you believe you said that? We're Gentiles. We're Gentiles. And Peter didn't want to go and tell the gospel. Is there someone that you know of that you think, man, they're not worthy of Jesus? Shame on you. Shame on you. So it took a dream, actually, and we know, read about that in Acts 10. And finally, Peter said, I'll go. And God miraculously, miraculously sent people, and they came and brought them to the Gentiles, Cornelius and his household, which could have been more than 100 people. And as he was began to relay the gospel, as he was telling them about Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit fell on them. It didn't require Peter laying hands on anybody, mind you. And those that will tell you have to come to a man to receive the power of the Holy Spirit, they need to read your scripture. You don't have to come to me. You have to go to him. Let that soak in. Because in Acts 10, Peter was amazed. He said, wow, because the Holy Spirit fell on the Gentiles and their whole household, which could have been more of 100 people. And it says they spoke in tongues. And Peter was amazed at this. To him being a Jew, and these are a bunch of heathens in his mind. The Holy Spirit fell on them. And he was amazed at this demonstration of the Spirit. And, if, and the Holy Spirit fell on them. And, and as a result of that, Peter said, hey, is he, let's baptize these folks. I'm paraphrasing. Because after all, the Holy Spirit fell on them just like he did on us. Referring to Acts, Acts 2. See, the power of the Holy Spirit doesn't rely on a man to be given. That's right. He can fall directly. He can use men and women. But he can fall directly. You don't have to line up here and wait for Scott. You reach out to him. Let the power fall. Well, that's getting quiet in the room. Hey, how prideful it is for me to say, you have to go through me. How arrogant of me to say, no. Bruce, you can't have the gifts of the Spirit unless you come to me first. No, Bruce has direct access. As a matter of fact, in 1 Peter it says, we're a holy priesthood, a chosen generation. Did you know you're a priest? <laughs> if you're born again, you are a priest in the kingdom of God. And you have full access to the Father. The veil has been ripped. It's torn in two. You have, you have direct access to the Father. You no longer have to go through a person other than Jesus Christ. He's the baptizer of the Holy Spirit. He's the baptizer of the Holy Spirit. Now, we do read in the Scripture about the apostles that in Acts 19, even about them laying hands on people and they received the power of the Holy Spirit. We do know that. But we do know in Scripture, it also talks about the Holy Spirit on people without men's intervention. As in Acts 2, Acts 10, and other Scriptures as well. For we see that they were disputing. You know what they concluded at the end of that? At their great conference? You know, there's many denominations that have conferences. They get together and they discuss. And there are many, let's just talk a few moments about this. There's some mainstream denominations that get together, I'm going to trip on that yet. 
that get together in their conferences and they discuss if we're going to adhere to this scripture or not. They say, well, immorality, we're going to, be, we're going to name it as moral. Can man do that? Can we next week get together as a board and say, you know what, we're meeting and we are convening. There's, there's 10 of us, I think, as a board. And we get together and we vote and we say, you know what, immorality is going to be accepted in this church. And we voted in, hey, run from this church. Because man does not have the right to change God's word. They were trying to do that. They were set binding burdens on people they were unable to bear. The Jews were. And Peter concluded, no, you don't have to be circumcised to be saved. You have to come to Jesus Christ in the knowledge of him. And through his sacrifice he made, and his righteousness, not your righteousness, you are saved. Praise God, church. Come on, we ought to be excited about that. His righteousness. So if someone tries to put burdens on you saying such things as, well, you have to be circumcised or you can't be saved. You have to be baptized or you can't be saved. You have to speak in tongues or you can't be saved. Show me the scripture. Show me the scripture. See, the scripture is clear even here saying you don't have to be circumcised to be saved. We read in Colossians 2, even that circumcision equates to baptism to us, to Colossians 2. So even today, we're going to see baptisms, Lord willing, we'll see baptisms, and that is comparison to the Jew being circumcised. But it wasn't required for salvation. For you have direct access to the Father through Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit brings you to Christ. Colossians 2, 11 through 14 says this, And in him you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in the removal of body and flesh by the baptism of, by the circumcision of Christ. I'm sorry, circumcision of Christ, Christ. Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you also raised up uh, with him through faith in the work of God who raised him from the dead. That scripture is what you're seeing going to happen right here. Circumcision. What circumcision was to the Jew is what baptism is to the believer. To believe God, obey him, and to the Jew, they were to be circumcised. To the believer today, now it's baptism. Obedience. Are you saved only through baptism? That's not what scripture says. You're saved because of his righteousness. And you're asking him to come into your heart and ask you forgiveness. And he is faithful and just to forgive you of all unrighteousness. And you're what's called in scripture, born again. Mm -hmm. Born from above. Your spirit is renewed. You, something inside you has changed. You're not the same. If that's not happening, we're just going to get you wet today. Right. But if that's happened, we're going to see a celebration. We're going to see a celebration of new life. See, it says that even here, this happened when you placed the, in the tomb with Jesus Christ through baptism. <clears throat> see, symbolically, this is a tomb. And you're being buried into the tomb. Mm -hmm. And that means your old man dies. And your eyes walk in newness of life. See, if someone here, even today, if someone thinks that baptism saves you, and then they go, they think, check the box, and go back to their old way of life, and live just like everyone else, they're missing it. That's a false teaching and false doctrine. That's right. But because you're born again, you want to reenact what's happened in your life. Death, burial, that's why we bury baptism, and resurrection to newness of life. Philippians 3.3 3 says this, For we are the circumcision which worship God in spirit and in truth. I rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Question. What does it mean, because this scripture calls about worshiping in spirit. What does it mean to worship God in spirit 
and in truth. What's that mean? You know, some people think differently on that. What's it mean? We can figure out what truth means. It means adhering to the scripture of God. The truth of God's word. What's it mean to be worshiped in spirit? What, what's it mean? Some would say, well, that's when, you know, when we really worship in spirit is when we are convulsing and doing things and doing all these other outward things and we're doing... No, it's not outward stuff. It's, it's inward stuff. It's out, not outward stuff. See, so often we attribute outward, outward stuff to people that we think are super spiritual. Sometimes the most profoundly mature believer is the one that's so quiet and just humbling before God and falls before Him and is broken. Created me, David said it this way in Psalms 51, creating me a clean heart, O God. Restore a right spirit. See, if it's ever about you, you're missing him. So he said again, if it's ever about you, you're missing him. See, it's becoming your righteousness. Look at me. As opposed to look at him. To look at him. The Holy Spirit. The reality is that you can't be saved. You can't be saved except for the Holy Spirit. Amen. See, in the first Corinthians chapter tweet, chapter 12, verse 3. Chapter tweet. Turn to chapter tweet, please, right now. I'd like to see you find that one. Amen. First Corinthians 12, 3, Paul even says, You can't come to Christ except the Holy Spirit draws you. Chapter Acts, chapter, oh, sorry, not Acts, John, chapter 6, verse 45. Jesus even says, you can't come to me, except the Spirit Father draws you, the Holy Spirit draws you. You can't. The Holy Spirit is essential for salvation. What you're seeing today, when people are born again, they're born of the Spirit. They've been regenerated from within, and otherwise they're just getting wet, right? Amen. So that's why we ask them, do you know Jesus Christ? And when they're born again, they, the Holy Spirit has come within them and brought their spirit to life. Now they're renewed, and they're crying out to the Savior. The Holy Spirit will always, always aim you to Jesus Christ. Amen. Always. See, there are some churches that will talk only in, about the Holy Spirit and rarely about Jesus. The Holy Spirit will aim you to Jesus Christ. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. And those of us who have been born again, I want to encourage you. We need to be praying for the power of the Holy Spirit. We need to be praying for Him to fall on us, renew us every day. That we reach out to Him. The baptism of the Holy Spirit occurs when the Spirit of God comes upon a believer. The Holy Spirit fills the believer's mind with a genuine understanding of truth. It imparts gifts that qualify the believer for service for the body of Christ. To be baptized in the Holy Spirit. For Him to saturate your soul comes upon the believer and empowers you for service. You read about that in Acts 1.8. He said, go to Jerusalem, you may tarry from on high. You may tarry that you may receive power from on high. Saints, today, more than ever than ever, we need the power of the Holy Spirit Amen. that will change our lives. Amen. Help us another day. Help us another day. We need the power of the Holy Spirit to fall on us as believers. Be baptized by the Spirit of God. Be born of the Spirit of God. That He comes and empowers us for a daily walk. Each and every day. Let the gifts flow as he distributes. So often we become narrow-minded in saying that when the power of the Holy Spirit falls, it's just one gift. No, we have access to all gifts. All gifts. See, John 15, verse 26 says this. When the advocate comes, whom I will send to you, 
from the Father. Jesus is speaking. The Spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify of who? Of Jesus Christ. That's why we are a Christ-centered church. A Bible-believing, Christ-centered church. We believe in the Holy Spirit. We believe in God the Father. We believe in the Son, Jesus Christ. We believe in the deity, uh, the trinity of God. We believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. We believe in the gifts of the Spirit. We believe in the, in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We believe and know that to be true. But we know that through the Son, we have access to the Father. And the Holy Spirit brings us right here. Right here. So we see in John 16, verse 4, 13 through 14. Howbeit when He, the Spirit of truth, is come, He will guide you into all truth. For He shall speak, He shall not speak of Himself. Speaking of the Holy Spirit. But whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you the things to come. He shall glorify me, Jesus says. For he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. We need truth, right? We want to worship in spirit and in truth. How do you worship in spirit and truth? We need the Holy Spirit to reveal to us the truth. And this scripture tells us, he will show us. Who wrote this, by the way? The Holy Spirit wrote this book. And he will show it to us. We need to pray, God, show us your truth. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, we can have revelation of the truth. And we can worship our Father. It, when we grasp this, it will change our worship. You know, as praise and worship leaders, we love to see people in worship. But sometimes we err in trying to make you worship. Saying, well, sis, I appreciate your brother. I appreciate all the things you're doing. But you need to be doing this and this and this. That's what excites me. <laughs> it's not about me. Hey, we need to always aim into Jesus Christ. And when you fall in love with Jesus Christ, he will change your worship. Come on. Listen, you want to have greater worship? Fall in love with Jesus Christ. Every one of us. He, through his righteousness, we worship the Father. Boast only in the cross. Galatians 6.14 says this. See, saints of God, when we start saying, I'm going to say it again, when we start saying, look at me, we're missing <coughs> When we can demonstrate him in all humility. Sometimes even the gifts, the Corinthians were having trouble with this. Because of some of the gifts, they were thinking they were better than you. Hey, I have this gift, and I'm better than you. Huh. No. No. Let the Holy Spirit bestow the gifts, and all glory goes to him. All glory. Can someone say amen on that? Amen. We're not better. The preacher is not better than anyone else. I'm just obeying what I'm supposed to do. How are you? Paul goes on to say, no, have no confidence in the flesh. He of all people could say that because he had great, he had accumulated great education. He says, but you know what? All that stuff that I do in the flesh, I consider it dumb. I consider it manure, is what interpreted would be. That's what that is. And there are some things in the religious world that is, quite frankly, manure. Manure. What do you mean? That's kind of rough. Well, take it up with Paul. There's some things in self-righteousness that is manure. Our righteousness is found in Jesus Christ. Paul found this out, and he says, man... That's why he says, for me to live is Christ and die is gain. Mm -hmm. And all that stuff I accumulated, that's okay. But really, I need Jesus. I need his righteousness. For us to be born again, we must understand we need his righteousness. 
that I'm made whole. I mean, pastor, it is, the gospel could be that simple. I just receive Christ in my heart and give him my life. Yeah. And his righteousness is poured on me. Yeah. It's that good. Well, that will make us happy. It's that good. It's that good. I'm made righteous through him. So do I have to do any good works? You were created to do good works. When you understand that you're made righteous through him, you want to obey him. You want to please him. Amen. Lisa and I have been married 40 years. I really miss her right now. I really do. She completes me. And it's hard for me just, just to think about, she's not here right now. She's texting me and telling me what to do. <laughs> no, not really. But her heart's here. Because we complete each other. And we want to please each other. I want to do things because I want to show her my love. I want to show her I love her in, in different ways. Because I want to. Yes. See, when you love Jesus, you want to. It won't be what I have to. It's like this. If it's Lisa's birthday, and I go and I buy something for her, and I work hard at it, and I go to her and I say, here, I worked hard at this. Good, I hope you're happy. <laughs> oh, that's a great gift right there, right? <laughs> I hope you're happy now. I, it's, it cost me three hours, and I have a look, and there, happy birthday. It's like, that <laughs> smack me, right? <laughs> no, you don't do that. You, whatever sacrifice you make is because you love them. And sometimes we treat God like that. We say, I got up early this morning for you, and I almost made it on time. I, I, I come close, and look what all the things I did for you. There, are you happy? Really? Really? I went and got baptized. Are you happy now? Really? That's not love. That's just working at it without love. Where's the love? What about, I can't wait to worship you. I can't wait to give you my sacrifice of praise. What about, I can't wait to obey you in baptism. I, I can't wait to serve you. I can't wait to take communion. I can't wait to be obedient to you. I can't wait to do things for you because I love you. Where did that go? Where did that go? There's a huge difference in serving him, giving him your life, because you love him. Do you love him? Yes, I do. See, that's in John 21. Jesus asked disciples, do you love me? Oh, yeah, we, we, we're kind of friends with you. No. <laughs> Do you love me? Well, you know, we phileo, and then we know the different stages, and ultimately said, to you. <coughs> Do you love me? Do you? Jesus looks in your eyes and says, Do you love me? Do you agape love me? So death do your party. And even that doesn't separate you. Isn't that amazing? Even that doesn't separate you. There's a big difference between religion and relationship with Jesus Christ. How many of us is really can't wait to live for stuff? I mean, I can't get enough stuff. Some people I know have a lot of stuff. But that's okay. The question is, does your stuff own you? Or do you own your stuff? Isn't it sad to think stuff is what I'm living for? And that's it? There's a story of someone I know that lived a life for stuff. Even started a family business for stuff. And he came to the end of his career, built a family business, decided to try to sell it from underneath his family to get the money for stuff. Found out he couldn't. 
found out he couldn't sell it without their signature. And they refused to sign. So now this person is a recluse. Won't speak to his kids, won't speak to his family, won't speak to his wife. Lives in a, another building. They haven't seen it for a long time. Isn't that sad to think about because of stuff, I put that as more important than you, more important than you, more important than you. As he comes to the end of his days, what's going to be said at his funeral? Where's the trailer with all his stuff? The stuff. <laughs> yep. And the broken relationships. And no savior. No savior. So the person has lost his family, has lost his kids, and I, I happen to know this person. Lost his family, lost his kids because of stuff and doesn't know a savior. <coughs> Sad, isn't it? And there are people living for stuff each and every day. Life's about relationships. It's not about stuff. And maybe you've been putting stuff ahead of your relationship with Jesus Christ. Maybe you've been too busy for him. I guarantee you in my marriage, if I always told her I'm too busy for you, that would not fly. <laughs> Nor should it in our walk with Jesus Christ. Are you really think, let's just think of thing for a moment. Do you really think you're that good that you're going to stand before God someday, because every one of us will, Put the judgment seat of Christ. It's in Romans 14. You're going to stand before God and say, God, I'm here and I'm just that good. And, you know, I got a lot of junk to give you. A lot of stuff. But I was just too busy to have a relationship with you. I was just way too busy. I lived 80 years and, and you know, I, I didn't pray much. I didn't, I, I didn't, think, I never even listen to you, or even read your word. Ah, you know, your son, you know, the one that died on the cross, that's a good thing. I, and that, that's good. But I really didn't embrace that. But God let me in. He will say, I never knew you. Your work was iniquity. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world but lose your own soul? How sad that is. But I'm here to tell you about life. Mm -hmm. I'm here to tell you about Jesus Christ. I'm here to tell you about the gospel. I'm here to tell you how good it is that he paid that price that we couldn't pay. He took the sin that we could never dismiss. You know that stuff in your life that we call sin that you can't ever get good enough? I, I mean, I dare say maybe this week you tried to become a gooder person. I know that's <laughs> terrible in English. I know that. But my wife's not here so I can get away with it. No, I'll hear that way home. You're going to become a gooder person, and you determine you're just you're going to read the book of Psalms. You start and you say, Psalms 119 is long. <laughs> Psalms 117 is short. I'll read that. And then you, you read that, and then maybe you, you said all week long I'm going to read Psalms 119. I'm going to earn my, my love for God. I'm going to earn it. And, I'm, and you just can't quite get through the whole chapter in one setting. At the end of the week, you feel miserable because you, you failed. You're, you're a failure. You're, you're a failure. <laughs> See, that's where works ends up. You're a failure. But you're not a failure. The gospel is good news. That because of him, it's not your righteousness, it's his. And you're set free from yourself. I feel like preaching old days, so I, I go and I move on. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love of the Father is not in them. That's the first John 2 15. And I kind of like this graphic. It's kind of like, who would want to love the world? You know? But the reality is, you either love God or you love the God of the world. True joy comes through accepting Jesus Christ's righteousness. Notice how it's written. True joy comes in accepting his righteousness, not mine. To 
Today we're going to be bap have baptisms. I'm going to sing a song entitled, probably, yeah, get the kids. We're going to be entitled, uh, what is it, Graves? Graves in the Gardens. And I want you to listen to the song, especially maybe new to you, I want you to listen to the words. Because even it ties in with baptism, because this is symbolic of a grave, and it becomes a garden, new life. And I want to encourage those that want to be baptized, and there are quite a few today that have told me they want to be baptized. This is a great day. And I hope you understand what that means. It means a change of life. It means accepting His righteousness, not mine. It means Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. And you're professing before the people of God that you love Him. For all those that want to be baptized, would you please come and just stand or come in this area here and come in these seats right here, please?
your profession of faith in Jesus Christ and knowing him as your savior and giving him your life I proclaim that you are a child of God through Jesus Christ I have the privilege of baptizing you in the name of the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit Amen Hey this is a great day Zachary Amen <laughs> oh no! Most oh, Jesus is in your heart. That's really good. <laughs> you want to tell the church your name? My name's Caleb. Caleb, this is a great day. I know even Thursday night we had the opportunity to talk with you and to lead you to the Lord. And just, just to see your face. And honestly, I've been seeing conviction on him for the last few weeks. And I, I just to see God leading and touching your heart. And also, as we were sharing, he said he's going to get you wet with his hair. 
That's okay. Oh, yeah. That's right. <laughs> well, Zachary, do you believe in Jesus Christ as the Lord of City Hill? <laughs> what did I say? I said Zachary. <laughs> hey, senior moments, right? <laughs> Caleb, do you believe in Jesus Christ yes. as your Lord and Savior? Are we willing to give him your life and submit to him? Yes. Well, based on your proclamation of faith, we'll come on into the baptistry. Is there anything you want to share with the church based on what Christ has done in your heart? He's a model too. He's a model too. Amen. 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 how old are you? 60. Almost, 60. almost 70. Yeah. Isn't that funny? I'm 60, almost 59. <laughs> <laughs> you get younger, you want to be older. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, Caleb, I got your name right now. <laughs> this is a great day for you. And you can't you are never more than a man than you are right here, right, right now. Right. This is gonna change that's your right. life right. and Jesus in your heart. Let the Holy Spirit be upon you, in you, and through you, and he will guide you everywhere. Right? Based on your proclamation, hold your notes. I baptize you, Caleb, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Exactly what he said is on there. Want to tell the church your name? Breland. Breland Smith, yes. Breland, now we've had an opportunity to talk with you about who Jesus is. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? Do you believe he's your Lord and Savior? Is he living in your heart? Oh, that is awesome. Okay, you want to step on in? <coughs> Breland, is there anything you want to say to the people? <laughs> I don't blame you. Other than Jesus is Lord, right? You confess Him as Lord and Savior of your life. Yes. Breland, you want to sit down? Well, based on your confession of faith and your heart for the Lord, I have the privilege to baptize you in the name of the Holy Ghost, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Yes, Jesus. Right. Amen. Amen. Church, your name? Austin. What's your last name? Smith. That's why I thought. Yeah. Yeah. Austin, do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Are you willing to give Him your life? Do you know Him with your heart? Well, Austin, based on your proclamation of faith, it's a great opportunity to baptize you. <coughs> You'll step on down, please. Is there anything, Austin, you want to tell the church? No? All right. Well, let's sit down. <clears throat> How old are you, Austin? Eleven. Eleven years old. Awesome. Wow. Well, Austin, based on your profession of faith and saying Jesus Christ is Lord of your life, I have the privilege of baptizing you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Amen.